presentation, Zoe. It is really wonderful to be here. And thanks for the kind introduction. I will now attempt to share my presentation. So let us see how this goes. I would also ask everyone to mute themselves at this point if you haven't. Thank you very much. All right, so are we seeing what we want to be seeing, which is my screen? Yes, well, clearly. Yeah, great. OK, thank you. So as I say, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to speak with you, even from afar. On the screen, you now see one of my favorite monuments, the 15th century spire of Strasbourg Cathedral, the tallest surviving product of the medieval architectural imagination. I believe that such structures deserve a prominence in scholarship commensurate with their prominence in the landscape. But late Gothic developments in general tend to receive short shrift in textbooks, classes, and other such surveys of the Gothic tradition. The basic thesis of my talk this evening, therefore, is that late Gothic architecture deserves more sympathetic and systematic attention than it has received to date. As my title implies, I'll be discussing the evolution, extinction, and afterlife of this tradition. As you'll see at the end of my talk, I've chosen the former terms with deliberate reference to Darwin's intellectual legacy. I'll be sharing a great deal of material, so I should give you a roadmap before I embark. First, I'll discuss how the late Gothic tradition evolved smoothly into a variety of regional and national subspecies. These late variants, I'll argue, should be seen as legitimate parts of the Gothic phenomenon in which many longstanding trends reach their culmination, and they should not be dismissed as decadent or aberrant. The eclipse of the Gothic tradition, therefore, should not be seen as the result of artistic or creative exhaustion, as it too often has been. Instead, I see this extinction event as the product of external forces that I call the three R's, Renaissance, Royalty, and Reformation. More specifically, I will discuss the emergence of rival architectural language in the Italian Renaissance, the adoption of that language and propaganda for royalty, and the impact of the chaos unleashed by the Reformation. After making this argument, I will consider the architectural and scholarly afterlives of the late Gothic tradition. On the architectural front, I will discuss the interplay between survival in the early modern era and programmatic revival in the long 19th century. On the scholarly front, I will trace the problematic influence of writings on the so-called Northern Renaissance before going on to discuss several recent books on the late Gothic architectural tradition, including my own. In assessing late Gothic as a category, it makes sense to ask, late compared to what? The history of European architecture has often been seen as moving from Gothic to late Gothic to Renaissance. Here exemplified by Reims Cathedral, St. Lawrence and Nuremberg, and St. Lorenzo and Florence, respectively. As many of you recognize, the simple model fails to fully capture the enduring vitality of the late Gothic tradition, which flourished for over a century after the beginning of the Italian Renaissance. The choir of St. Lawrence, for instance, was designed several decades after Filippo Brunelleschi developed the strongly classicizing design of St. Lorenzo. Renaissance and Gothic design thus coexisted side by side for most of the 15th century. As this book illustration by the French painter Jean Fouquet suggests, moreover, the Gothic mode tended in this period to be associated with holy subjects, such as the Virgin and Child seen at right, while the classicizing mode was more associated with worldly figures, such as the book's patron Etienne Chevalier seen at left. With that lesson in mind, let us now trace more carefully the evolution of Gothic into late Gothic and the interaction of that tradition with its emergent classical rival. Gothic began in France in the 12th century, and by the middle of the 13th century, French builders had managed to create buildings like Reims Cathedral, which show off the slender proportions, skeletal structure, and large windows stereotypically associated with the Gothic mode. The climax of this particular development came at Beauvais, where the soaring choir was completed in 1272 before suffering a partial vault collapse in 1284. Since subsequent builders never created a taller interior, this setback has often been seen, especially in France and America, 
as marking the end of the Gothic tradition's most heroic phase. As an English audience, you surely recognize the limitations of that narrative. English Gothic admittedly owed much to French influence, and Westminster Abbey at right clearly represents a direct response to Renaissance. Even before the start of work at Westminster, though, the builders of Lincoln Cathedral had begun to explore a very different mode, where the development of complex vaults emphasized the low and even tunnel-like quality of the richly articulated interior. By the middle of the 14th century, English designers had also developed innovative curvilinear tracery patterns like those seen in the famous west window of York Cathedral, which exemplifies the style now commonly known as decorated. At the same time, however, English builders were also beginning to explore the rather different aesthetic effects of the so-called perpendicular style exemplified by the Great East Window of Gloucester, now seen at left. The perpendicular mode would remain popular in England well into the 16th century, while the decorated mode mostly went out of fashion after the Black Death for reasons that remain obscure. On the continent, though, matters played out rather differently. By the late 13th century, builders in the Rhineland had developed daring extrapolations of French Gothic ideas, as one sees here in the remarkable tracery filigree covering the facade of Strasbourg Cathedral. Such designs could only be conceived with the help of drawings, some of which survive. The four meter high drawing known as Cologne Plan F, for instance, shows the facade of Cologne Cathedral complete with two traceried spires. The combination of the sophisticated Rhenish design tradition with the more exuberant articulation of the English decorated style would have revolutionary consequences, setting the direction of late Gothic design in Germany and Central Europe. This Rob, dramatic step was Rob, taken Rob, sorry people. to interrupt you, but we seem to be, I seem to be seeing slides some way back. Is that the case with um, the rest? Or I see Reims, Nuremberg and Florence, and I just wonder, uh, so the images are not moving, some others are saying. Um, same for me, I'm afraid. Same for you. I'm so sorry about this, but I just thought it's better to stop because I, it was clearly uh, happening for several of us. Um, strange. I'm sorry to hear that. I'm seeing what I'm talking about on the screen precisely. Uh, I'm seeing Prague interior on my screen right now. We're not there. We're still at the comparison of Reims, Nuremberg and Florence visually. I wonder where the solution might be if you um, unshare and okay. share. Again. And if there is a problem again, maybe one of us, Alistair or I in particular, maybe with stronger okay. Wi-Fi might be able to. Okay, I have stopped sharing. Sorry about that, but I just think it was not doing justice to you. Oh, yeah, no, clearly. Um, so I have stopped sharing, as I say. Yes. Do okay. you want Going to start again. Uh, or shall I do it, Rob? If you can do it, that may be better because I of think I will do it. I think I will do it because I'm possibly it's. Um, your bandwidth is being a bit strained by this. Evidently. So, so let me share, sorry, apologies to everyone. Um, I'll start from the beginning, but um, okay. I'll move on. Can everybody yeah. see this? I can. Yeah, yes. I can see that, that's great. All right, because I can't see now chat or anything else. So, and Alistair, maybe you can mute me in a second. Um, so, uh, Rob, we kind of got visually to here, so I don't know whether you want to return a little bit in your text or whether you want to. Yes, just I, think, I think if you all are not too worried about time, I will resume with this slide then. I think that's yes, probably. Yes, I think I'll be very happy with that actually. So okay. since we're all here, less Thank time you. for questions, but yes, more time for answers. So, all right, I will resume with this. Thank you for the warning. Okay. As this book illustration by French painter Jean Fouquet suggests, moreover, the Gothic mode tended in this period to be associated with holy subjects, such as the virgin and child seen at right, while the classicizing mode was more associated with worldly figures, such as the book's patron Etienne Chevalier seen at left. With that lesson in mind, let us now trace more carefully the evolution of Gothic into late Gothic and the interaction of that tradition with its emergent classical rival. Thank you. Gothic began in France in the 12th century, and by the middle of the 13th century, French builders had managed to create buildings like Reims Cathedral, which show off the slender proportions 
skeletal structure and large windows stereotypically associated with the Gothic mode. The climax of this particular development came at Beauvais, where the soaring choir was completed in 1272 before suffering a partial vault collapse in 1284. Since subsequent builders never created a taller interior, this setback has often been seen, especially in France and America, as marking the end of the Gothic tradition's most heroic phase. As an English audience, you surely recognize the limitations of that narrative. English Gothic admittedly owed much to French influence, and Westminster Abbey at right clearly represents a direct response to Renaissance. Even before the start of work at Westminster, though, the builders of Lincoln Cathedral had begun to explore a very different mode, where the development of complex vaults emphasized the low and even tunnel-like quality of the richly articulated interior. By the middle of the 14th century, English designers had also developed innovative curvilinear tracery patterns, like those seen in the famous West Window of York Cathedral, which exemplifies the style now commonly known as decorated. At the same time, however, English builders were also beginning to explore the rather different aesthetic effects of the so-called perpendicular style, exemplified by the Great East Window of Gloucester, now seen at left. The perpendicular mode would remain popular in England well into the 16th century, although the decorated mode went out of fashion after the Black Death for reasons that remain obscure. On the continent, though, matters played out very differently. By the late 13th century, builders in the Rhineland had developed daring extrapolations of French Gothic ideas, as one sees here in the remarkable tracery filigree covering the facade of Strasbourg Cathedral. Such designs could only be conceived with the help of drawings, some of which survive. The four meter high drawing known as Cologne Plan F, for instance, shows the facade of Cologne Cathedral complete with two traceried spires. The combination of the sophisticated Rhenish design tradition with the more exuberant articulation of the English decorated style would have revolutionary consequences, setting the direction of late Gothic design in Germany and Central Europe. This dramatic step was taken at Prague Cathedral, which combines large windows and soaring proportions with the curvilinear tracery and complex pattern vaults of the decorated mode. The author of this innovative synthesis was Peter Parler, who guided the Prague workshop in the latter half of the 14th century, and his realistic portrait bust can be seen in the cathedral's triforium, attesting to his high reputation. Members of Parler's family would go on to play leading roles in many major Gothic building projects of the period, as at Milan, where the huge and craggily detailed cathedral was begun in 1386. Sluter's bust provides just one example, showing that realism could thrive in Gothic architectural settings, wholly independent of classical influence. This can also be seen at left in the mourners seeming to walk around the tomb base of Burgundian Duke Philip the Bold, carved by Klaus Sluter in his workshop around 1400. Three decades later, Jan van Eyck achieved even more dramatic effects of realism using oil paints, while still working in a Gothic architectural environment, as seen with the Virgin embodying the church at right. By this time, Brunelleschi had nearly completed the Dome of Florence Cathedral, whose overall shape had been decided before his birth. With its pointed profile, octagonal plan, and ribbed structure, the dome deserves to be recognized as a product of the Gothic design tradition. Brunelleschi engaged more with the classical legacy in smaller and less challenging projects. At the Florentine Church of San Lorenzo, for instance, he used round arches and classical columns to create a simple box-like structure resembling an early Christian basilica. Since Florence was a republic at this time, unlike rival Milan, I am tempted to imagine that the classical mode here was deliberately meant to invoke the Roman Republican legacy. While I certainly recognize the importance of such projects in launching the Italian Renaissance, I should emphasize that architectural culture throughout the rest of Europe remained overwhelmingly Gothic throughout the 15th century. In France, for example, buildings such as saint maclou and Rouen combined traditional French verticality with curvilinear tracery inspired by the English decorated style, which had by then been displaced by the perpendicular mode in England itself. This French variant of late Gothic tends to be known as flamboyant, in part because its window tracery often displays flame-like patterns. In Germany, designers following the lead of Peter Parler built many complex pattern vaults, 
as seen here in St. Lawrence and Nuremberg, a hall church where the side aisles reach the height of the vaults, creating a broad and open interior space. The Strasbourg spire, meanwhile, took the Gothic idea of skeletalization to a literally new height, with light and air circulating between the tracery panels and openwork stair turrets that cover its surface. Openwork structure also characterizes the soaring mid-century spire of the town hall in Brussels at right. Although this spire marks a secular rather than religious structure, it borrows heavily from the vocabulary of church design. In both Brussels and Strasbourg, the construction of the spires expressed civic pride. In both cases, moreover, the openwork construction was made possible by the extensive use of metal reinforcement. I should stress at this point that the Gothic architectural tradition was progressive and innovative in both formal and technical terms. It has aptly been described as medieval modernism, therefore, and the term modern was used for this mode in the 15th century itself. The invention of the openwork spire was one striking product of this progressive attitude. From the Germanic world, the openwork spire idea spread to Spain, as here at Burgos Cathedral, whose bishop was impressed by such structures when he attended the Council of Basel. The designer of the spires was Johann von Kolb, who became known as Juan de Colonia after his move to Spain. His son, Simon de Colonia, went on to build the large chapel of the Castilian constables in the foreground of this view of the cathedral from the east, while his grandson rebuilt the crossing tower in the middle ground. The interior of the constable's chapel shows how Simon de Colonia adopted his father's expertise in openwork design to the construction of an octagonal openwork vault that impressionistically recalls Spanish Islamic structures from centuries before. An even larger octagonal vault had been built several decades earlier by the Aragonese architect Guillem Sagrera, not in the Iberian Peninsula, but in Naples, as part of the restoration of the local castle. This campaign was not exclusively Gothic, however. A classically styled triumphal arch was also built between the older towers of the castle entrance. This significantly was one of the first times that the Italian Renaissance formal vocabulary was used as an instrument of royal propaganda. The patron in this case was Alfonso I, king of both Naples and Aragon, seen here in a classicizing medallion. Alfonso claimed that he had learned more about warfare from reading Julius Caesar than he had from his contemporaries, an implausible claim that nevertheless illustrates the use of the Roman legacy as a touchstone for Renaissance rulers. Simultaneous with Alfonso's project in Naples, the multi-talented Leon Battista Alberti was writing up theories of Renaissance painting, sculpture, and architecture, and offering his services as an architect to various Italian warlords and to the papacy. The reemergence of a powerful papacy in Rome played a crucial role in establishing the ancient Roman mode of design, originally associated with pagan emperors, as a legitimate stylistic option for Christian patrons. The papacy had been consolidated in Rome in the early 15th century, following the resolution of the Great Western Schism, and Rome became the undisputed center of Christian empire following the sack of Constantinople by the Ottoman Turks in 1453. At left, you see a painting made two decades later, showing Pope Sixtus IV installing Bartolomeo Platina as Vatican librarian, while the future Pope Julius II looks on. Both Roman and Neapolitan connections helped to spread Renaissance culture to the court of Hungarian King Matthias Corvinus, the first ruler outside of Italy to adopt classicism as a crucial visual language of royal authority. Matthias was a political ally of the papacy, and his wife Beatrix of Aragon was from Naples. At left, you now see a Florentine manuscript originally made for Matthias and Beatrix, who appear here in a classicizing architectural environment, flanking a central medallion depicting St. Jerome. Unfortunately, most of the buildings erected in Matthias's reign were destroyed in the subsequent occupation of Hungary by the Turks. Their impact can be registered, however, in the neighboring kingdom of Bohemia. Here at Vladislav Hall in Prague Castle, for example, Italianate windows likely inspired by Hungarian prototypes alternate with slender Gothic buttresses. The most impressive feature of the hall is its elaborate late Gothic vaulting designed around 1490, which represents a dynamic curvilinear elaboration of the patterned vaulting concept 
introduced to Prague Cathedral by Peter Parler more than a century earlier. The designer of the hall, Benedict Reed, even applied the characteristically Gothic idea of dynamic torsion to the otherwise classical pilasters framing the entrance hall, thus creating a fascinating synthesis of architectural modes. Renaissance design elements began to spread more widely throughout Europe in the years around 1500, in large part because Italy was invaded successively by French, Spanish, and German forces. The French King Charles VIII kicked off the spate of invasions in 1494, seeking to claim the throne of Naples. This was during the papacy of Pope Alexander VI, seen at far left. The pontificate of this Spaniard had already begun to foster artistic exchange between Italy and Spain. It was thus the Spanish monarchs Ferdinand and Isabella who commissioned the construction of Vermontes Tempieto in Rome in 1502. At that point, Gothic architectural culture continued to flourish in most of Europe. At left, for example, you see the huge transept of Beauvais Cathedral, begun in 1500, which fully matched the record-breaking height of the cathedral's 13th century choir. This fact clearly demonstrates that the late Gothic builders had not lost their nerve or ambition, even in the 16th century. The Beauvais transept utterly dwarfs the Tempieto, as this comparison suggests, so the Tempieto's designer, Bramante, would soon begin to develop plans for St. Peter's in Rome, seen in the metal at right, whose vault height would approach that of Beauvais. While the Beauvais transept was under construction, French designers explored diverse stylistic options in secular projects. Slide, please. Yeah, thank you. The Parliament of Normandy above remains firmly grounded. Uh, back, please. The Parliament of Normandy above remains firmly grounded in late Gothic tradition, but the Chateau Wing of Blois, built for King Francis I, incorporates classical elements such as prominent pilasters that clearly reflect the king's fascination with Italianate Renaissance culture. In England, the Gothic remained even more dominant than in France in the first decades of the 16th century. The spectacular fan vaults of King's College Chapel in Cambridge at Wright rank among the most impressive products of this era. Even more dramatic are the pendant fan vaults of Henry VII's chapel at Westminster, which are often seen as marking the culmination of the English Gothic tradition. Are you seeing the proper slides here, Henry VII's chapel? There we go, thank you. The exterior of the chapel, please, uh, was also innovative in its day, featuring faceted wall surfaces covered by dense grids of tracery. I'm not yet seeing the exterior. There we go. Thank you. In Germany, too, slide. Thanks. The first quarter of the 16th century saw the creation of virtuoso designs like the double layered branchwork vaults of the Frauenkirche in Ingolstadt, now seen at left. As in France, though, Renaissance classicism was beginning to emerge as an alternative mode in this period. Among the first examples of this new trend was the chapel in Augsburg commissioned by the Fugger family, who enjoyed close mercantile ties with Northern Italy and whose wealth helped to support the Habsburg emperors. The design of this chapel, which incorporates round arches and simple piers beneath its Gothic vault, has sometimes been attributed to Albrecht Durer, but this point remains controversial. The drift from Gothic to Renaissance articulation can also be seen in the successive stories of the Tower of St. Killian's Church in Heilbronn. We know from documentary sources that German observers of the time actively distinguished between the stylistic modes they called Deutsch and Welsh, meaning German and Italian, which can stand as rough proxies for Gothic and Renaissance. It is impossible to say how those trends would have evolved on their own terms, because design practice inevitably responds to social, political, and cultural forces and to shocks from outside the strictly architectural sphere. In 16th century Germany, the largest of these shocks came from the Protestant Reformation, launched by Martin Luther in 1517. His critique of the Catholic Church and the period of religious warfare that followed undercut the foundation of ecclesiastical patronage on which Gothic builders have long depended. Another crucial factor in the demise of the Gothic tradition was the spread of illustrated architectural treatises like those published by Sebastiano Serlio, of which you see a page at left. 
Such treatises help to make the Renaissance formal vocabulary and the theory behind it accessible to patrons and builders across Europe. Since the Gothic tradition involved dynamic processes of geometrical unfolding, rather than adherence to fixed canons of proportion, it could not be communicated so readily in print, a disadvantage that made it less appealing than Renaissance design. By the 1530s, therefore, the Wittelsbach Duke summoned Italian builders to Lanshut to erect a palace in a strictly classicizing mode that left the mixed vocabulary of the Fugger Chapel far behind. Thanks to the spread of illustrated theoretical treatises, buildings like the Lanshut Palace embodied the ideas of correctness and authority more effectively than Gothic buildings could. In the first decades of the 16th century, major new Gothic projects nevertheless continued to be launched, especially in the Iberian Peninsula. In Salamanca, for instance, the new cathedral begun in 1513 preserves the soaring lines, pointed arches, and vertical articulation characteristic of Gothic design. In the cathedral begun two decades later at Granada, however, the Gothic piers have been replaced by clusters of classical columns whose prominent entablatures break the vertical flow, and the arches have become round, even though the overall spatial and structural envelope resembles that of Salamanca. The embrace of classicizing form proceeded even further in the palace built in Granada for Emperor Charles V, whose circular central courtyard has sober articulation recalling Bramante's Tempieto. This stylistic choice makes good sense in the context of Charles's propaganda, which increasingly presented him as a successor of Rome's great emperors. In Portugal, too, one can trace a politically motivated shift from late Gothic to Renaissance design. Here you see the interior of the Hieronymite Monastery at Belém, a hall church with a complex late Gothic vault built in the reign of King Manuel I, who was known as Manuel the Fortunate because of the great wealth that his kingdom began to acquire through the spice trade following Vasco da Gama's pioneering expedition to India. The Manueline Gothic style also appears in the upper piers of this unfinished chapel complex at Bataya, whose florid complexity contrasts with the relative sobriety of the lower story built in the 15th century. The chapel complex was abandoned in the reign of Manuel's son John III, who turned against many elements of his father's legacy. At Tomar, for instance, John III sponsored the creation of a new cloister whose Renaissance design reflects the impact of Sierra Leone's treatises. In the middle decades of the 16th century, kings across much of Europe were enthusiastically embracing the Renaissance mode and its Roman associations, both imperial and papal. In Spain, therefore, the Escorial complex built for King Philip II uses a classicism even more severe than that seen in his father Charles V's palace at Granada. In France, the Louvre was rebuilt in a somewhat fussier Renaissance mode in the reign of King Henry II. With the advent of such projects, the Gothic tradition was pushed into the background. In England, of course, the narrative played out rather differently. Gothic remained the dominant mode into the early 16th century, as we have seen with the chapel of Henry VII. The tomb of Henry VII, however, was made in Renaissance mode by the Italian sculptor Pietro Torgiano. Italianate influence began to manage itself, itself increasingly throughout the reign of Henry VIII, who sought to rival Francis I of France and Emperor Charles V as an up-to-date patron of the arts. The English Gothic tradition might well have survived this encounter with Renaissance artistic culture, had Henry not also broken with the Catholic Church over his contested desire to divorce his Queen Catherine of Aragon. As in Germany, therefore, the Reformation undermined the patronage structures that had long supported Gothic architecture, even as it also complicated the reception of Renaissance classicism. By the middle of the 16th century, therefore, the confluence of Renaissance, royalty, and Reformation had decisively displaced the Gothic tradition from its longstanding position of architectural leadership. I see considerable irony in the fact that the growth of national governments actually contributed to the demise of many national Gothic styles and the international spread of Italianate classicism throughout Europe. The emergence of art historical writings disparaging or dismissing the Gothic mood soon added insult to injury. In his pioneering Lives of the Artists, first published in 1550, Giorgio Vasari presented a seductive account of how Italians, 
including especially his fellow Florentines, had rescued the arts from their supposed medieval nadir by recovering the forms and standards of classical antiquity. By his day, the Gothic no longer seemed modern or progressive, and he unfairly castigated it as disorderly. The most significant northern response to Vasari was Karl von Mander's Schilderbuch, published in 1604. While Vasari had included architecture in his account, von Mander did not. Instead, he chose to focus on paintings in the graphic arts, emphasizing the achievements of northern painters such as Jan van Eyck, whose work was even more realistic than that of their Italian contemporaries. Von Mander thus played a key role in establishing the canon of Northern Renaissance art, which grouped together the representational art of the 15th and 16th centuries, while ignoring the potentially embarrassing fact that Northern European architectural culture had remained overwhelmingly Gothic and medieval down to 1500. Although the Gothic tradition lost much of its market share and most of its creative energy, after 1525 or so, Gothic forms continued to be used in some conservative contexts, even throughout the 17th century. In the German world, for example, the Jesuits built some impressive churches, such as St. Maria Himmelfahrt in Cologne, which are often described as post-Gothic. In England, construction in a residually Gothic mode continued at the venerable colleges of Oxford and Cambridge, as exemplified here by the fan-vaulted vestibule of Christ Church at Oxford. In France, the builders of Orléans Cathedral sought to evoke the Gothic tradition even in the decades around 1700. Although they admitted that they were unfamiliar with this mode, it is interesting they chose to frame their portals with curved gables of broadly late Gothic flavor, rather than evoking an earlier version of the style. Back in England, Nicholas Hawksmoor evoked the Gothic tradition even more impressionistically while designing the towers of Westminster Abbey in the first decades of the 18th century. In cases such as these, conformity with actual medieval buildings certainly informed the choice of the stylistic mode. By the late 18th century, though, the Gothic had begun to exert a fascination even beyond such contexts, setting the stage for a more programmatic Gothic revival. Horace Walpole's remodeling his Strawberry Hill house with decorative fan vault seen at left provides one fan famous early instance of that phenomenon. Another key event in the establishment of the Gothic revival movement was a publication in 1772 of Goethe's essay von Deutscher Baukunst, or On German Architecture, which praised the facade of Strasbourg Cathedral as an expression of Germanic genius. By the middle of the 19th century, the German Gothic revival had acquired enough momentum to launch the most ambitious cathedral completion project of the era at Cologne. When the cathedral's twin open works fires were finally completed in 1880, in accord with the original 14th century drawing I showed you earlier, they were the tallest structures in the world. Neither of these designs was truly like Gothic, however, and neither was as characteristically German as originally believed, since both depended strongly on French precedents. In England, the design of the Houses of Parliament, developed by Charles Berry and A.W.N. Pugin, deliberately evoked the late Gothic tradition exemplified by the Henry VII Chapel. Since this perpendicular style was unique to England, one might have expected that it would have become the dominant strain of the English Gothic revival, but this was not to be. Pugin, a convert of Catholicism, concluded that medieval spirituality had weakened by the time of the Reformation, and he thus chose to emulate the earlier phases of Gothic in the rest of his career. Other English Gothic revivalists, such as the prolific George Gilbert Scott, often adopted looser and less archeological approaches to the Gothic tradition, as at St. Pancras Station and the adjacent hotel complex. In France, meanwhile, the early phases of Gothic received the lion's share of the favorable attention in the era of Gothic revival. Victor Hugo's celebrated 1830 novel, Notre Dame de Paris, for example, helped to set the stage for the renovation of the cathedral by Ville le Duc in the middle of the century. It is hardly surprising that the French would emphasize an era when their country exercised so much political and artistic leadership. In Portugal, conversely, the late Gothic era of King Manuel the Fortunate stood out as a golden age. One of the most important projects of their Gothic revival, therefore, was the extension of the Heronite Monastery in Belém, whose complex vaulted interior I showed you earlier. 
The growth of Czech identity, meanwhile, helped to catalyze the completion of Prague Cathedral through the addition of a nave seen at left that was closely modeled on the innovative choir built by Peter Parler in the 14th century seen at right. By the years around 1900, as it became clear that the design of the recently completed Cologne Cathedral actually had a strongly French flavor, many German scholars began to celebrate late Gothic hall churches like Nuremberg's St. Lawrence as more authentic expressions of national spirit. In Belgium too, the late Gothic era that had produced a Brussels town hall came to be widely appreciated. Starting in the 1870s, therefore, the so-called Maison du Roi was built immediately across the square from the city hall, and a very similar style was chosen for the Belgian pavilion at the World Exposition held in Paris in 1900. Two years later, a major exhibition of 15th century painting was held in Bruges. Although the paintings in question were produced in an era when Belgium was dominated by Gothic architecture, the paintings continued to be viewed positively in the 20th century, while the corresponding architecture did not. The rejection of the Gothic revival had a lot to do with the emergence of modern architecture, here exemplified by Walter Gropius's Fagus Shoe Factory from 1914. For those who saw this austere and reductive architecture as pointing the way to a gleaming industrial future, the historicism and finicky detail of the Gothic revival appeared retrograde. The rather narrow nationalism of many Gothic revival movements also contrasted strikingly with the internationalism to which many champions of modernism aspired, even before the outbreak of the First World War. Shortly after the war ended, Johann Hatzinger published one of the most enduringly influential studies of late medieval culture, Herfstei der Mittelleben. In this book, first known to English readers as the waning of the Middle Ages, but more properly translated as the autumn of the Middle Ages, Hatzinger memorably wrote that, quote, the flamboyant Gothic is like an endless organ postlude. That horror of vacui, which may perhaps be identified as a characteristic of end periods of intellectual development, dominates in this art. The further the departure from purely pictorial art, the more unrestrained the wild overgrowth of formal ornamentation covering content." Close quote. In the decades that followed the publication of Hatzinger's book, as modernism dominated the visual arts, late Gothic architecture continued to be widely disparaged and dismissed, even by experts in the period. The eminent art historian Erwin Panofsky, for example, built on the century-old legacy of Karl von Munder's Schilderbuch by embracing the idea of a northern renaissance in which the realism of 15th century painting could be framed as marking an early phase in the development of modern worldview, as his title, Early Netherlanders Painting, here suggests. This northern renaissance framework continues to inform the writing of textbooks, such as this one by James Snyder, that problematically exclude architecture. This framing, moreover, stands in sharp contrast to Hautzinger's view of the period as one of autumnal decline. Reacting to contradictions such as these, Jan Biaschdaki in 1966 published a still useful survey article entitled Late Gothic Disagreements About the Concept. Biaschdaki observed four main trends in the treatment of this material. Late Gothic as Renaissance, Late Gothic as Baroque, Late Gothic is German, and Late Gothic is a thing in itself. Bialystocki rightly saw the last of these as the least problematic, but even in this framework, disagreements arise about the boundaries of the category in terms of time, space, and medium. Just a year after the appearance of Bialystocki's article, François Cali published Dordre Flamboyant, which considered the visual culture of the late Middle Ages in a holistic manner strongly influenced by Hautzinger. Like Hautzinga, Kale described the period as one of darkness and doubt, devoting chapters to themes such as the dance of death depicted here and comparing late Gothic buildings to the negatively coded Tower of Babel. So while the book's excellent black and white photos nicely capture the virtuosity of late medieval design, Kale's likening of these complex forms to tears and to the flames of war underscored his dark judgment of the era. In 1971, Roland saint presented a far more positive view in his book on French flamboyant architecture. Unlike Hautzinger and Cali, saint saw the late Middle Ages as a time of increasing liberty. As you can see from the chapter titles at right, 
He stressed the ideas of individual expression and autonomy, which he saw as compatible with communitarian spirit. In all these respects, Saint-Fasson saw positive parallels between the late Middle Ages and the late 1960s, when he'd been writing his book. As his third and fifth titles indicate, moreover, Saint-Fasson was interested in regionalism and in revivals of local tradition, which provided alternatives to the constraining legacy of 13th century conventions. His book's pages thus abound with photos of quirky details that suggest emancipation from those conventions. Saint-Fasson here implied parallels between French flamboyant builders and the student revolutionaries of his own day, who rejected the values of their square parents. Importantly, too, he contrasted the supposed liberalism of the late Gothic era with the more totalitarian approach embraced by Renaissance rulers. He thus concludes his book with these two sentences. Quote, it was the kings of France who, in order to better display their worth and impose their power, ultimately suppressed an artistic tradition that promoted participation and exchange between all people. It is not impossible for our contemporaries to rediscover flamboyant architecture and to discern bit by bit the meaning of its forms, close quote. I'll return to this provocative thesis in a few minutes. In the decades following the publication of saint Francois's book though, his ideas had no direct sequels. One of the few synthetic books on late Gothic to appear in this era was Wim Swan's Art and Architecture of the Late Middle Ages from 1977, which covered the period from 1350 to the advent of the Renaissance. As you can see, Swan began his book with a chapter on the tenor of the age, which he saw as dark and troubled as Hatzinger had. Unlike Kali, though, Swan moved beyond this judgmental frame to celebrate late medieval achievements in a more neutral, geographically organized survey, as the subsequent chapter headings show. A year after the appearance of Swan's book, John Harvey published what rather surprisingly remains the only synthetic scholarly study of the perpendicular style. As the title page shows, Harvey chose to stop his survey at 1485, thereby excluding canonical masterpieces such as the fan vaults of King's College Chapel at Cambridge or the pendant vaults of Henry VII's Chapel at Westminster. He made this choice because, as an English nationalist, he saw the art and culture of the Tudor era as impure and corrupted by Italian influence. Harvey's political views are now widely seen as rather problematic, but he was not wrong to recognize a potential tension between English Gothic tradition and the growing fashion for Italian imports. The France 1500 catalog published in 2010, conversely, dismisses such tensions, rather blithely describing the late Gothic and Renaissance modes as two parallel modernisms and passing in silence over the fact that the French Gothic tradition was rendered largely obsolete by the 16th century embrace of Italian classicism. Studies such as these thus failed to capture the dynamics of architectural change at the close of the Middle Ages. And they remain constrained by national boundaries, unlike Swan's more superficial survey. The arrival of Matt Cavalier's book, Renaissance Gothic in 2012, therefore, mark the advent of what I see as a vibrant new era in the study of late Gothic. Cavalier's chronological scope was narrower than Swan's, covering only the period from 1470 to 1540, and his chapters were thematically rather than geographically organized, as you see it right. Cavalier places a strong emphasis on ornament, and many of his chapters thus emphasize the viewer's perception of complex forms. His final chapter is particularly interesting because it introduces the ideas of deconstruction and hybridity. By hybridity, Cavalier means the combination of classicizing and Gothic decorative modes often seen after 1500, as in the pendant vaults of Saint-Pierre and Caen seen at left. By deconstruction, he means the architect's deliberate incorporation of fictitious errors into the fabric of the building. At right, for instance, you see the aisle vault ribs at Bimpfenamberg which appear to slide past each other, held to the piers only by fictive bolts, whose presence has induced the opening of fictive cracks in the stone. Cavalier finds these witty details interesting because they suggest the builder's self-consciousness, both about the nature of Gothic structure and about the uses of representational illusionism. Cavalier is an excellent photographer, as you can see, but his book's greatest value lies in its provocative framing and pan-European scope. Pablo de la Riestra's recent book, Die Revolte de Gothic, 
provides a beautifully illustrated survey of late Gothic and the Germanic world from 1350 to 1530, thus covering a broader chronological range than Cavalier's study, but a narrower geographical range. Like Cavalier and saint passant de la Riestre concerns himself mostly with formal developments. His book is divided into 40 short chapters, most detailing with specific motifs such as arch forms, complex vaults, and gable formats. Some of the longer chapters, though, deal with larger problems, such as the relationship between antiquity, Gothic, late Gothic, and Renaissance. As you can see here, de la Riestra seeks to show both how Gothic skeletalization left the Roman legacy behind and how late Gothic builders further innovated by creating new patterns of space and structure in which the last vestiges of classical detailing were abandoned. Like Cavalier, de la Riestra considered the deliberate witticisms, disjunctions, and fictive errors that give many late Gothic monuments a mannered flavor, very different than the more serene and systematic flavor typical of French 13th century buildings. De la Riestra's main thesis, in fact, is that German late Gothic designers revolted deliberately against the conventions of French Gothic design. His book thus incorporates many opposing photos like the pair below, contrasting the craggy forms of Beauvais Cathedral at left with the smoother and boxier outlines of St. Severi and Erfurt at right. Since de la Riestra prefers the latter mode, he celebrates the emancipation of late Gothic designers from 13th century convention, much as saint Vincent had, while adding a contrast of national traditions unseen in Vincent's work on France. In the past two decades, I've enjoyed many conversations with Cavalier and de la Riestra, whose work I greatly admire. None of the books on late Gothic that I've read, however, really addressed the questions I wanted to answer, so I decided to write my own, whose basic results I have tried to summarize today. As my subtitle indicates, I sought to understand the evolution, extinction, and reception of late Gothic architecture. I aimed, in other words, to understand how late Gothic developed from early Gothic, how it was displaced by Renaissance classicism, and how its story has been told in the five centuries since then. As in my talk today, I adopted a chronological approach, going from antiquity to the present, with most of my energy focused on the period between 1300 and 1600. As you can see from my table of contents, I divided that span into 50-year slices, or in one case, a 25-year slice. And within each of those, I created geographically defined subchapters. This approach is tedious, as I can attest after writing the whole thing, but also has significant advantages in terms of juxtaposing simultaneous events that are usually considered separately, thus giving a clearer sense of how the cultural changes in question actually unfolded. Unlike the other books that I've discussed today, moreover, mine includes Italian developments alongside transalpine ones. In my introduction, for instance, I juxtapose late Gothic buildings from Germany, Spain, and England, the San Lorenzo and Florence, which Brunelleschi had designed more than half a century before any of them. Unlike most of my colleagues who've recently written on late Gothic, moreover, I give detailed consideration to developments from before 1350 that helped to set the stage for late Gothic. One early section of my book, therefore, discusses the English decorated style of the early 14th century, in which one can already see forms such as flying ribs, cusp arches, and complex network vaults that would figure prominently in the latest phases of Gothic around 1500. As you see, typical pages in my book include only black and white images. Fortunately, I was able to include color images at the back, which may tempt readers into engaging with my massive text which runs to over a quarter million words. The book got so long in part because I was attempting to trace not only formal developments, but also their political contexts. Ultimately, I came to believe that saint Fasson was right when he argued that French Gothic had been abandoned because the kings of France adopted Italianate classicism as their visual language of quasi-imperial propaganda. I found that similar dynamics unfolded all over Europe, and this cultural sea change was responsible for displacing Gothic architecture from its long-standing position of artistic leadership. Because I agree with saint Passant's basic diagnosis, I was pleased to learn last year that a new version of his book was being published, enriched with new illustrations and with extra chapters written by younger scholars to contextualize his contributions. My talk today, in fact, 
relates closely to the essay that I wrote for that volume. Building on Saint-Faustin's final lines, I developed the idea about cultural climate change into a governing metaphor for my larger book project. I argue that the extinction of the Gothic tradition paralleled the extinction of the dinosaurs. While most scientists once believed that the dinosaurs succumbed to some inherent flaw that made them evolutionary dead ends, it was recognized in 1980 that they had in fact been wiped out by a catastrophic asteroid impact that quickly changed the global climate. Late Gothic architecture similarly has often been derided as an artistic dead end, but I argue that the Gothic tradition was developing fine on its own terms before the royal appropriation of Renaissance art and the chaos of the Protestant Reformation conspired to destabilize the foundation of patronage on which large-scale Gothic construction projects has depended. My dinosaur metaphor thus stands in stark contrast with Hatzinga's autumnal metaphor. While Hatzinga naturalizes the demise of late medieval art as the outcome of inevitable cultural senescence, I stress instead the contingency and complexity of historical process. I agree with Hatzinga, though, that it makes sense to view 15th century Northern art as a product of late medieval culture rather than as an early manifestation of the Northern Renaissance. There is, of course, much more to say about these questions, but for the moment, I will conclude by saying that I'm happy to be part of this conversation and I'm grateful to have this opportunity to share with you my thoughts on late Gothic architecture and its curiously conflicted reception. Thanks very much for your time and attention. And thank you, Zoe, for the manning the slides. That is most helpful. So, questions are coming. I'm are muted. I'm, I'm going to mute myself. I'm going to ask everybody to unmute themselves and give you a round of applause. It's very hard that you can hear it all the way in Iowa. <laughs> Thank you. Many, many thanks for this uh, really, truly panoptic view of uh, architectural history unfolding over many centuries through buildings and also through writing. I'm sure there will be uh, lots of questions. I'm now switching over to look at the participants. And uh, normally what we do, we ask you to raise your hand. So I've got a sense of a sequence. Um, and also then to unmute yourself and preferably also to turn on your camera so that Rob can actually see you. But while you're perhaps mulling over your own questions, I wanted to um, ask you something to slightly use my position here and start off first. And that is, I mean, interestingly, of course, the weight of your uh, examples was, I mean, it was very balanced throughout. But, you know, even when I teach Gothic architecture as a kind of general aspect, the focus is quite often on ecclesiastical buildings, and mm -hmm. there are lots of explanations for that. I mean, do you think that actually the dynamic in ecclesiastical and secular architecture is rather different um, in terms of the reasons why? change might occur. I mean, you know, in ecclesiastical terms, Gothic cathedrals are quite often, very generally speaking, connected with the idea of heavenly Jerusalem and so on. You know, does that notion change somehow? The other thing I wanted to ask you, this is going back to the quote that you, uh, you know, invoked several times about the impact of French royal family. I mean, do you think that there is a moment where something starts, but then the repercussions are perhaps not the same. There is an element of fashion yeah. that catches on where the original ideological reason, whatever that may be, or political reason, is sort of um, disappears and different kind of forces take over. Absolutely. Thank you for both of those questions. Um, so to the first question, yes, I do think that the dynamics evolve differently in secular and religious projects and also in funerary contexts, one of the things that I get into in the book further that I just touched on with the tomb of Henry VII, for example, is that it's often the smaller scale uh, funerary complexes that are sort of the canary in the coal mine, where it's dynastic program, where they're wanting to connect with the, the Roman legacy, often the imperial legacy, and it starts in the smaller, more affordable media, and then it percolates out from the smaller media, sculpture, funerary architecture, into the larger scale projects, usually first in the secular realm, 
palace architecture especially, and then diffusing from the funerary and secular into the large-scale churches. That's usually the sequence you see in country after country. And I absolutely agree with your point that, yes, it's a peer pressure question where once the king starts doing it for his palace or once the fuggers start doing it for their chapel, they become influencers or trendsetters and that other people begin to jump on the bandwagon uh, out of fashion rather than out of deep aesthetic or ideological conviction. Yeah, exactly. Thank you very much. Now over to our audience. Any hands or just switch on your microphone, please, if you have a question to ask. I could go on, but I shouldn't really. Any questions? Still so thinking? Okay, well, I'll, I will carry on then. The other question that I wanted to ask you is to do with, I mean, you're focused on patrons somewhat, well, actually quite a bit, on the kind of um, aesthetic aspects of buildings. We were looking on the stylistic shifts. What about the, the masons actually working on them? I mean, how did this shift occur? Did these, you know, poor German Gothic masons who've just discovered how to do diamond balls suddenly found that everybody wanted them after 1550 or whatever. Um, you know, did the Italians come initially and train them? And it, I know that each case is slightly different, but it, as a kind of, you know, as a sort of general ch shift, how do you see this happening? As you, again, you're exactly right in saying it varies from place to place and time to time. But usually what I'd say is that the leading edge is Italian artists coming in to do, you know, a tomb or a sarcophagus or something small. And then they also will do literal window dressing, uh, putting the frames in like we see in Hungarian examples, for instance, uh, or sending parts from Italy to Spain, like for the palace at Calahora, uh, early 16th century. And so it's sort of Renaissance in a box, as it's been described. Um, and then they train or have dialogue with local masters who might either hybridize that with their own tradition in a sophisticated way, like, like Benedict Reed, Reed. Mm -hmm. or they might begin to assimilate it into a local practice like Pierre Lescaut at the Louvre. Um, and I would say, again, the tipping point for me is when the locals assimilate the Renaissance mode enough to do it themselves. So Lescaux, for example, or uh, you know, Juan de Herrera in Spain, once they're doing it in their own mode, and that means, to your question about craftsmanship, for example, that the, the Louvre is really cut with the kind of quality of stone cutting that you would get in French Gothic. Um, it has that tradition, whereas the Hungarian examples are more tack on where you have a nice window frame stuck into a more or less traditional fabric. So how rapidly the details can get assimilated into the, the structure depends a little bit on how modular the buildings are by their nature. And in, in Hungary, it's pretty flexible. And in France and Spain, it's there's more inertia because of the building practice. Thank you very much, Rob. We have um, Richard Plant um, patiently waiting. Richard, do you want to unmute yourself and perhaps even switch on your camera? Hello, sorry to be so slow. I'm using the world's most rubbish computer. Um, I suppose it follows on rather from Zoe's question, but is a very Robert Bork question, which is to say one thing that you have done is you have elucidated in my more um, cogent moments to me a number of things about late Gothic geometrical design. And it seems to me that many earlier Renaissance particularly works are much more simple, mm -hmm. um, quite the opposite, I suppose, mm -hmm. of Vasari's heinous slander about Gothic. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts about how that kind of geometric, I mean, is it just a loss or are 
old ways of conceiving continued or and so on and so forth i'm sure you can talk all night on this i'm afraid i can yeah don't get me started um no it's an important question and i thank you for putting it out there um my observation in writing my geometry book was that working with geometry on the computer or working with the geometry visually was a delight it was a joy and i could readily imagine a young apprentice working with his master in the gothic tradition thinking this is beautiful and having no trouble following what the practices are but then when i turned to write the book i realized that it translates very awkwardly into prose um, and it also translates very awkwardly into a single frozen image because it's a process. Um, the, the rules, the conventions of Gothic design are procedural conventions that tell you how to play the game and not what the final score is gonna be. Whereas the Renaissance canons of proportion much more tell you what the final thing will look like, which means you can boil it down to a single book plate more readily and you can look at it and tell whether it's been done properly or not. So it, the Renaissance tradition is communicable in word and simple image, much more so than the Gothic traditional geometrical procedure, which really has to be learned by kind of doing it with somebody in the workshop. And what that means as a consequence is that princes and intellectual patrons who are outside the workshop are able to interface with Serlio or Alberti in a meaningful way. Gothic has nothing really of that kind. Roritzer, Schmudermeyer, Leckler try, but they don't really convey very successfully the, the flavor of the process. And so I actually, if I want to be contentious, which I often do, um, I would say that the Renaissance in architecture involves a shrinking of the dignity of the artisan because the artisan, Peter Parler or whomever, really did have a great deal of creative liberty and autonomy in the 14th century. And you didn't have the patron giving him a hard time about the proportions of a column or something. But once you have Serlio kicking around, then the king or the prince or the patron will be looking over the architect's shoulder and saying, hey, it says here on page 35 that your column is supposed to be seven times as high as it is wide and yours is eight. What's your problem? Well, I think it actually undercuts the authority of the artist, the architect in a significant way. And that's kind of the inverse of what I think has usually been understood. Thank you, Robert. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Robert, and thank you, Richard. Um, I would like to encourage you uh, to ask any more questions, if you have them. Either by raising your hand or tuning in. Thank you. It is quite late on a Friday here. <laughs> OK, so um, Robert, which I mean, you were talking about balancing out differently the uh, structure of your own book. Um, was that something that occurred to you as you were writing, or did you set off to write in that way, deliberately setting yourself apart from the contemporary authors you were citing, like Cabla? Um, I'm very much committed to chronology, just in the way I teach and the way that I frame things in general. Uh, I really kind of make spatio-temporal maps in my head in order to organize things. And I'm much more comfortable in that mode than I am with thematic teaching or thematic textbooks. So it just speaks to my habits of mind, I guess. When I first proposed the book um, years ago, I imagined that I would have a sandwich of case by case studies by country. Here's what happened in France, here's what happened in Hungary and so forth. And that would minimize the cross cuts and jumping around back and forth. But as I developed the project, I realized that that was not a good way to do it because you would lose the sense of chronology and causality and fashion 
And I realized it was much more uh, effective to me to really try to stick as close as possible to chronology, even if that involved going around in circles, the same circles each chapter, um, it got rather repetitive and as tedious to write, but I was really happy with the way that the sequencing goes. If you just flip through the book, it's not typical book on Gothic that you find, you know, Brunelleschi in the first 20 pages, um, but that's the way the chronology actually evolves here. So I thought it was a good call, ultimately. I hope my readers may someday agree. <laughs> Well, but it's also interesting to, you know, the, how the students respond to it, because, I mean, didactically, it's also quite an interesting approach. Now, I see that Leslie is ready to ask a question. Leslie, do you want to unmute yourself? Hi there. Yes, th thank you for a, a really fascinating presentation. I learned a lot from it. Um, I'm coming at this as a modernist looking at uh, across 19th and 20th centuries um, and Germany, Central Europe. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that there's probably a there's a, certainly a story to be told about 20th century uh, goth. You wouldn't call it Gothic revival, but it's certainly a, a continuing interest in Gothic architecture, mm -hmm. in, in architecture as well as in other spheres of culture. Um, and so, it, you know, if you're ever interested in following that through, uh, my own PhD supervisor Barbara Miller Lane. Um, mm -hmm was it had wrote a great book called national romanticism in in germany and scandinavia and that, that's the kind of label she used for it but she was really interested i mean national romanticism is really a late 19th early 20th century thing but she she sees it as uh as a kind of um uh, embrace of things northern as she calls them um, and Gothic that then gets picked up by people like alvar alto and uh, and some kind of German expressionists mm -hmm. that um, continue to practice in the even into the post-war period. And of course, I mean, she also wrote a famous book about um, about Weimar and Nazi architecture mm -hmm. and uh, and the influence on the Gothic and na Nazi architecture is, of mm -hmm. course, well known as well. Mm -hmm. But I think it's certainly I'm sure you could easily say that the late Gothic doesn't really get a look in and all of that, that it's a. It, the fascination for the 20th century people is with the with the kind of gothic as primitive or gothic as uh, highly simplified and not as refined. Well, there are I think, multiple threads in that. And I think you're right that it's extremely convoluted story that's worth telling and worth unpacking. So I think that the late gothic actually does get central billing for many of the German theorists around 1900 because they embraced the late gothic. Uh, what Gerstenberg called the Sondergothik, uh, the special Gothic of Germany, as distinct from the simpler earlier French Gothic. So yes, maybe the French invented Gothic, but we Germans invented late Gothic. And that becomes central in like the Bialystoki article as well. Then there's also the point about um, like the, the Bauhaus, looking back to the Bauhuta of the Middle Ages, and so you know, Feininger's engraving of the cathedral or woodcut of the cathedral for the Bauhaus, and I learned then that Gropius actually had a reproduction of the great tower of Ulm Minster in his office throughout his career. So clearly, even though the formal vocabulary was very, very different, um, the spirit of the the Bauhuta was something that they valued, and the the spirit of the master mason. As far as the the, germ, the Third Reich, that has been creepy to me because when I go back to see who's been writing on the late Gothic towers and the late Gothic drawings, it's an awful lot of people like Otto Kletzel who are very much involved with the, the government then. Um, and conversely, I should say, they they were... The people in the Third Reich were often interested in the kind of mysticism of geometry. And that was like a special German genius. And that got tainted by their politics. And then after the war, there was a reaction against that by people like um, Konrad Hescht, who wanted to say, it's not geometry, it's not mumbo jumbo and mysticism, it's just 
foot units. It's just modules. You just count them, and that's all there is to it. And so I have found it very, very hard to convince current German scholars of the importance of geometry because it's tainted by this Third Reich history um, by association. And so there are a lot of threads in what you're talking about, and I haven't unpacked them all by any means, but I have run across several of these things, and it is a live issue. You're right. So yeah, thanks very much for the comment. I'll want to follow up on that. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Rob, very much. I'm just realizing how much my own office needs the reproduction of the uh, Tower of Women Minister. Yeah. Um, uh, probably every office should have one. Exactly. Um, <laughs> I don't see any more questions forthcoming. Uh, this is your um, last answer. Thank you. Um, and indeed, thank you from me and thank you on behalf of the Centre for Architecture, Space and Society um, and on behalf of our audience for this uh, tour de force on a Friday night here in UK. And, um, you know, it'd be very interesting to talk to you more in future about, you know, the re reception of your book or maybe how your own ideas have changed uh, thinking about this really very, very large subject. Um, and so with that, um, again, I think another perhaps round of applause to to thank uh, Rob for very much for, um, you know, his generosity with his ideas tonight. So, um, yes. And thank you so much. I really appreciate it. If anyone wants to follow up the email or whatever, I'd love to continue the conversation that way as well. So. Very good idea. Very good idea. Okay. Thank you so much. And, Thanks um, so much. Goodbye. Until okay. next time. Yeah. Bye-bye.